more guns, less crime. Now, what that you know that's going to be a hot topic today. I have the author of that book, More Guns, Less Crime, and his name is John Lott, Professor John Lott. And it's going to be a, a fun conversation today about firearms, because in Hawaii, we have a lot of people that are afraid of firearms. So give us the scoop, Doc, Dr. Lott. Well, I mean... You, why did you write this book, first of all? Uh, well, I academic. I was at the Wharton Business School at the time. I was teaching a class on white collar and corporate crime. I'd done a lot of research on crime over the years. I hadn't really been that interested, hadn't been interested at all in guns, really. Uh, I've been chief economist of the U.S. Sentencing Commission. Anyway, I was teaching this class, and some students came up to me one day, and they said, could I talk about gun control a bit? And I said, well, you know, I suppose I could say something. I'll go, if I'm going to give a lecture, it kind of forced me to read through the literature at the time. And and I was what just, was your opinion then on firearms? Uh, I was probably a pretty moderate type guy, and I, you know, I just, uh, I probably believed a lot of the same things a lot of people did, despite working in crime areas. I had just, uh, you know, we're all influenced by the media. You know, you hear constantly about bad things that happen with guns. You, you know, when's the last time you listened to the news and heard somebody using a gun defensively to protect themselves? And I think that forms a lot of people's basis for what they think the costs and benefits of guns are. And I was no different. And so, uh, anyway, I started looking at this literature, and I was pretty shocked by how really poorly done a lot of the work was. Uh, they were all very small studies. Nobody had even tried to account for things like the impact of law enforcement on crime. Uh, and when you're an academic, there's two reasons why you do a paper. Either you have a new idea, which is usually the reason why I do papers, or you think you can do a better job. And so this was, this was the latter. So you, put, you compiled your work and you produced this book, and now you're on your third edition, right? Right. Third edition just came out last year. It's continued with each edition to be the largest study that's ever been done on crime. Uh, you know, I look at data for all the counties in the United States from 1977 through 2005, literally try to control for hundreds of different factors. So, you know, I don't think it makes much sense to go and pick a few counties in the United States to look at because you're never really sure how did I pick those counties or how did the person who did that. And so you use all the counties for all the years that the data is available and following each over time and try to account for as many factors as you can that can explain the changes in crime rates. So in Hawaii, we have this big uh, debate over concealed carry. We don't have concealed carry. We're one, how many states do have concealed carry now? Well, there's, there's 48 states. Well, it depends how you count them. You have 40 states that have so-called right to carry laws. Uh, those are objective permitting rules. You're a certain age, you pay your, you pass your background check, you pay your fee. Once you've met those requirements and you apply for a permit, then it's automatically granted. And then there's like seven states which are may issue, which actually do issue permits, but they're more restrictive. You have to demonstrate some need. That's Hawaii. Hawaii, Hawaii is a may issue. Well, yeah, but Hawaii, I was going to make that as an eighth state. Okay. Down to seven, <laughs> because Hawaii is like those other seven states right. in that you can demonstrate need, uh, but Hawaii doesn't issue any permits. So it, it's like the one of the May issue states that have the law on the books but don't give anybody the permits, the mm -hmm. ability to go and carry. And then you have two states, Wisconsin and Illinois, which officially, unlike Hawaii, which practically doesn't allow it, which officially doesn't allow people to carry permanent concealed handguns. That's going to change pretty soon. Uh, it's, it seems pretty clear that Wisconsin is going to adopt a right to carry law this year. And so they'll basically just be Illinois that officially bans it and Hawaii which practically bans it. So I'm fascinated with this idea that um, the media is always telling you the bad story, but how about telling us what you discovered? Are there good stories? Are there people who were saved because somebody had a firearm or because they had a firearm? No, I mean, you see this all the time. Uh, most people don't know that over a quarter of the public school shootings have been stopped by citizens with guns before uniformed police were able to arrive. There's many multiple victim public shootings, many crimes. There's websites that collect local news stories. Uh, KeepingBearArms.com has a wide collection. Uh, uh, the NRA has some. There are other groups that collect these things. The thing is, even though many of these get local news coverage, they just don't get national news coverage. They don't, most people don't hear about them. And um, even when you look at the local news stories, it's basically the smaller rural markets that cover these the most, even though we know 
from surveys, whether it's by the Department of Justice or other surveys, that the vast majority of defensive gun uses occur in urban areas where the vast majority of crime is. You know, you look in the United States, uh, the 3% of the counties account for about 75% of the murders. So they're about 23% of the population, but they account for 75% of the murders. Wow. Uh, and those are very heavily urban areas that you have. I'm sure most people would guess what the large cities are that are there. Um, and uh, half the counties in the U.S. have no murders in any given year. Uh, another quarter have about one murder. But So it's very heavily concentrated. And even when you look at those 3% of the counties, if you've ever lived you know, in Los Angeles or New York or Chicago, they'll go and maybe every once in a while the newspaper there will have a picture of where the murders are within the city. And even there, they're very heavily concentrated in very small areas within the city. They're not spread out over there. So you have you know, the vast majority of murders in the United States in very tiny areas of, of certain cities. Mm -hmm. Well, in Hawaii, you know, we always have our elected officials, our police chiefs saying, well, Hawaii has one of the lowest um, violent crime rates. We right. have a very high theft rate, um, that, you know, property crime rate. Sure. But they have, we, we supposedly have a lower uh, murder violent rate. murder rate. So they say, so why, why have guns? Why even give, and have you run into that, that uh, debate, that uh, point before? Right, well, I mean, Hawaii's had a lower murder rate before it had registration and licensing, too. If anything, I think the evidence shows that it actually increased slightly after, after that happened. But, um, uh, you know, my belief is that it's in the most high crime areas that you get the biggest benefit from owning guns. One of the groups that I find that benefit the most are poor blacks who live in high crime urban areas. It's basically the people who are most likely to be victims of violent crime who benefit the most from being able to protect themselves. My research has convinced me that the police are the single most important factor for reducing crime. I don't think there's much doubt in my mind about it. But I think the police themselves understand that they virtually always arrive on the crime scene after the crime's been committed. And that raises a question. What do you recommend that somebody do when they're having to confront a criminal by themselves? And simply telling people to behave passively is actually fairly dangerous advice. By far the safest course of action for people to take when they're confronted by criminals to have a gun. Well, in Hawaii, you know, the law was before, before last year, it was that legally you had to flee. You had to turn and run if somebody right. was in your home with a gun or trying to attack you. You weren't even allowed to defend yourself because you could have, um, you know, you could have been sued. So we did have two two uh, bills passed last year that uh, firearms advocates, Second Amendment advocates, were happy about. One was um, the seizure issue with uh, f can you seize somebody's firearms during a, a emergency. Mer yeah right, right. An emergency, and then also the it's a version of the Castle Doctrine where you can protect your, I guess it's called, you can protect, protect your castle, you can protect yourself in your castle um, and not get sued for it. But it's still not a, a pure bill. You know, it's not, it's not uh, the best bill it could be, but, um, but it was a big change from before. All these years in Hawaii, now you're, you're supposed to have, if somebody comes to in your home to kill you, right. you're supposed to run away. Well, I think those are improvements. Mm -hmm. And uh, the third edition, More Guns, Less Crime, I think is the first study that's been out that's actually looked at the Castle Doctrine. And what you find is that uh, passing seems to be related to some reductions in violent crimes. I think, you know, criminals can be deterred just like with higher arrest rates, higher conviction rates, higher prison sentences, the death penalty. Those things make it riskier for them to commit crime. The fact that a victim might be able to defend themselves also makes it riskier for them to go and commit the crimes. And, uh, uh, you know, so the fact that a victim doesn't have to run away, uh, I think not only makes the victim safer, but also makes it riskier for the criminal. And criminals will be less willing to go and break into people's homes. Uh, and when they do break in, they'll be more careful to make sure that people aren't there before they break in. So what are some of the things that you've uncovered in your, um, in your recent edition? I mean, we've had, we've had some big issues um, in the media recently with the Second Amendment Foundation's challenge to the hand uh, ban guns in Washington, D.C. Right. and Chicago. And, well, um, and then the emergency with Louisiana, their lawsuit to challenge um, yeah, well, whether or not lot, the seizure, right? Yeah, there's been a lot that's changed in the last 10 years since the second edition came out. Mm -hmm. uh, as you mentioned, we've had the Heller and McDonald decisions for Washington, D.C. and Chicago. 
And well, maybe you could explain that for people. So right. Well, I mean, the Supreme Court said that having a complete ban on handguns uh, was a regulation too far. Uh, where we go after that are going to be determined by other cases. But they said that people have a right to self-defense. And uh, in D.C.'s case, the Supreme Court also struck down their gun lock laws, that they had rules there that essentially made it a felony for you to have an operational gun, a long gun even, within the city limits. As soon as you loaded it, you would have been committing a crime. And that made it very difficult for people to use guns defensively. And the Supreme Court said, not only can't you completely ban all handguns, but you, if people do have guns, they have to be able to use them. And so you can't have a, a, a gun lock law that makes it a crime to load the gun. And, uh, you know, the really interesting thing is I think a lot of Americans kind of knew how Chicago and D.C.'s murder rates went up after the bans. They went up very dramatically. What they may not know is how murder rates and violent crime rates have fallen in those two cities after the bans have been knocked down. In Washington, D.C., the murder rate's fallen by over 36 percent now since the ban was struck down. Now, that's a pretty phenomenal drop within two years. And, uh, you know, it hasn't gotten much attention nationally. My guess is if the murder rate in D.C. had soared by 36% afterwards, it would be a major national discussion. Chicago, uh, the Supreme Court just made its decision last June. Uh, in the first six months of last year, Chicago's murder rate had gone up 5% above what it had been the first six months of the previous year. In the last six months, it's down by 14% now compared to what it was the previous year. And... Uh, you know, this wasn't the predictions that gun control advocates were making. They were arguing that not just that it wouldn't fall, but they were arguing that murder rates and violent crime rates were going to soar in those places. And instead, we find murder rates now dropping to lows that they were in D.C. now and to the early 60s you have to go back to, and, and Chicago, the mid-60s. So, uh, and you know, the thing is, though, People often seem to think that somehow Chicago and D.C. are unique around the world, that other places' bans have worked. And yet, I can't find a place around the world where we've had a gun ban and murder rates have gone down. Give me an example, like England, for example. Right. Well, I mean, you can even look at island nations. Okay. Okay. Because the claim, just back up a second, because the mm -hmm. claim in the United States is, well, D.C. and Chicago and Oak Park and uh, some of the other places that have had bans really weren't fair tests because they say, you could go and buy guns in other places in Illinois, or you could go and buy guns in Maryland and Virginia, and so the criminals could still get them. But, um, you know, we have other countries that have banned it over the whole country. We have island nations that have banned it over the whole island nation. And yet we still see the same increases uh, in England, for example. They banned all handguns in January 97. And... Uh, uh, there's not been a year after the ban went into effect where the murder rate's as low as it was beforehand. It's gone up for a few years there, went up as high as 50% above what it had been prior to the ban going into effect. Uh, the average has been about 35% higher than what it would be, than what it was right before the ban went into effect. But you can look at places like Ireland and Jamaica. Ireland, the murder rate now is like something like 10 times higher than it was before the uh, gun ban went into effect there. In Jamaica, it's like eight times higher. Um, and you can see, it's really dramatic. I have the graphs in my book. But if you look at it, you just see, you know, Ireland's murder rates bouncing along. They put a ban in, and then it just shoots up the very next year. And it's, you know, continues rising. But it's just, and the same thing with Jamaica. It's just right after the ban goes into effect, you see this huge increase that's there. And, um, uh, you know, it's, uh, and the thing is, you would at least expect, or think, even if you get a couple countries where the murder rates would fall. And the fact that just every time it goes up, I hope it begins to get people to think that maybe these types of bans, I mean, the ban is the simplest type of rule. We have, I think the other gun laws are, have similar effects often. But, you know, the point is, um, who obeys these laws? And if I... You know, we all want to get guns away from criminals, but I think something like a ban. If we banned guns tomorrow in Hawaii, who would be the types of people who would go and turn in their guns? My guess is it would be most law-abiding good citizens that would do that. And the problem that you face with these gun laws is that basically if it's the law-abiding good citizens who disarm relative to the criminals, 
then rather than making life more difficult for the criminals, you can actually make it safer for them to go and commit crimes because they have less to go and worry about than they would have otherwise. Well, some of the issues here have been, um, you know, that we've heard in recent um, days, I guess, or recent weeks. Um, we have uh, women that are killed by, you know, in a domestic violence situation. They're, they're shot or they're beaten or whatever. Uh, by somebody much bigger than them, somebody usually who, who might be on drugs. And then we always have these marches for women, candlelight vigils, you know, right. down at the Capitol, we, and we, we hold candles for them, we pray for them, we give them cell phones, but nobody's allowed to have a firearm. And, um, you know, that, that's, um, that's just kind of the attitude here. I mean, we even talked about banning toy guns. Um, right. That's been a hot topic of the legislature, which um, taking them away from, the, you know, not selling them anymore to people under 18 years old. Um, so we're, we're so, we're so different than the rest of the country here, but, um, you know, what do you, you know, have you seen other states like Hawaii where they're just so against, I mean, I guess Illinois and, and, uh, well, I mean, Washington yeah, DC, other... but do you, are there other places like Hawaii that have this attitude? California possibly? Well, California isn't as far as, uh, as Hawaii. I don't know of any other state that, um, has you know as strict of regulations as why does, mm -hmm. but um, so we do. You think we're the most strict or one of the most strict? I think you're probably the most strict. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, uh, there are basically two groups of people that I find benefit the most from owning guns. I mentioned poor blacks who live in high crime urban areas. The other group are basically women and the elderly, people who are weaker physically, benefit much more from having a gun than a man does. For example, that. You know, when you're almost talking about violent criminals being males, when a male attacks a male, there's going to be a smaller strength differential that exists there on average than when a male attacks a female or an elderly person. And uh, so the presence of a gun represents a much bigger change in a woman's ability to go and defend herself than it does for a man. And it's an equalizer. That's right. That's yeah. exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's uh, uh, restraining orders, you know, uh, people have to understand that you know law enforcement deals with things after the fact usually, and uh, you know, and it'd be great if the police were there all the time, but they're not. And the problem that you face is that you have to really ask the question: What do you advise somebody to do when they're having to confront a criminal and the police aren't there? And telling a woman to behave passively, telling her to yell and scream, telling her to run away. There's real problems with all those things. Women tend to be slower runners than men are. Uh, you know, they're weaker physically, and a lot of damage and harm can be done there. And I wish we lived in a world without violence. That would be great. But we don't, and, the, you know, you have to face hard questions then about what's the safest course of action. You know, you can give them tear gas, uh, but there are limits to doing that. Uh, you don't want to use it when you're inside, or the woman's going to be just as affected as the guy's going to be. Uh, they don't always disable people quickly. Uh, it's difficult to use it outside sometimes if there's a breeze or if it's raining it's going to make it so it's not going to be very effective uh, or you may even get back in your own face and um, you know so there's some real limits and the, you know the benefit of having a gun is to try to maximize the distance between yourself and the attacker if you did have concealed carry in this state and people had took classes on it one of the things the instructors would tell you is you're not law enforcement your job isn't to go and arrest people. The benefits for you having a gun is to go and maximize the distance between yourself and the attacker. Police face much more difficult jobs than citizens do concealed carry because a police officer can't run and see a criminal and just see the guy running off and think his job's done. He has to be willing to go after that criminal, come into physical contact. And when you're purposely trying to get into physical contact with somebody, things can go wrong. And, uh, you know, that's where the police face the biggest problem. If a woman is already in physical contact with some type of criminal, she's already in a lot of trouble. And the point of a gun is to try to keep her from getting into physical contact with the person. Well, one of the things that we had in Hawaii was uh, there was a big debate over whether or not retired police officers would be allowed to carry, concealed carry. And, of course, that's that... just bizarre to me. Wait, I, I know, mean, because I, it, I know. It's... We trust these guys. Mm -hmm to go and do their job, you know, every day. Mm -hmm. And then somehow, uh, when they're off duty, you know, there's some, Illinois won't allow them off duty to carry mm -hmm. guns. Uh, you know, somehow, as soon as they, you know, take off their shield uh, officially, they, we don't trust them anymore. 
You know, here are people who are willing to do something for free. They're willing to carry around a gun. They know the benefits of carrying around the gun. They feel safe for themselves doing it. And if they see a crime, these are heroes that will go in and try to solve the problem that's there. And the notion that somehow trained people who have years of experience uh, were, and are willing to, in some sense, do a law enforcement job for free, you know, with all the budget problems and everything else, you would think this would be something you would jump at. But, you know, nationally, um, we had, for 13 years, we tried to pass a law that allowed uh, people who had been policed for at least 10 years, when they would travel around the country, to be able to take their guns with them. Um, and it was filibustered every year. Se late Senator Kennedy led the filibuster, saying that it would harm public safety to let people who had 10 years worth of training as police officers to be carrying their guns around. And, um, you know, there's so many potential terrorist targets. There's so many other places where crimes can occur. And, you know, here we have a way, we have like 700,000, 750,000 cops in the country right now. And, you know, why not let them do this for free when they're off duty? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things was federal legislation did pass, right? That, yeah, eventually. Um, it did after 9-11. Right, where it said that the, it, but it took us, I think, five years to finally implement. When did that legislation pass? Um, I think like 2003. 2003, so I think it, we only, last year or the year before, did we actually put the rules in place that would allow the, the police officers to get the permits, the concealed carry permits, um, and they had to pay a fee and go to a retraining class and things like that. And so every year they have to pay, I think it's a $500 fee. I mean, that's so, ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I mean, Hawaii police officers are perfectly competent if they were to go and travel in the rest of the country. Uh, why shouldn't they be able to have a gun? And what, you know, if they've been a police officer for 10 years, I mean, 10 years is a long time. My guess is they've seen a huge number of situations or they've talked to other people who have been there. And, you know, they've had plenty of practice firing a gun. And to believe that after 10 years as a police officer that these guys somehow still can't be trusted to go and do this without extensive additional training is just, as I said, it's just bizarre. What do you think is the most amazing or remarkable uh, statistic or piece of information that's in your book that you just published? Or that's just I coming know, there's out. There's a lot of different things. A lot mm -hmm. of things changed in the last 10 years. We've mm -hmm. had the sunsetting, the assault weapons ban. I think uh, that's interesting. I mean, that's a type of discussion that's coming up a lot again now after the Tucson shooting. And, um, you know, one question I would like to ask a lot of the politicians who are trying to push this is you're predicting massive increases in murder rates and violent crime and robbery in particular after the sunset in 2004. What happened? You know, murder rates fallen by 17% since then. If you got that wrong, why do we believe that you're gonna be more accurate in terms of the claim benefits that you're making now for these types of laws? But I think probably the most amazing thing to me, if I had to put down, is just the fact that I can't find a place where murder rates have fallen after a gun ban's gone into effect. Um, you know, to me, that's a huge change in the debate because I've been debating Paul Helmke from the Brady campaign and others over time. And, you know, I bring it up, and they can't come up with anything, and it just, it's pretty funny at some point that, you know, if they, you know, uh, if you can't point to any place around the world where we've had a gun ban and murder rates have fallen, uh, you really have to wonder what, what, why they keep pushing these types of things. So what about the Gabrielle Gifford shooting, um, that and, and the shooting with involving other people as well? That, uh, you know, that's been a big issue here in local talk show debates and, you know, should, uh, and, and the, the people opposed to Second Amendment um, are, are saying that uh, that's a good example of why there should be, um, you know, more restrictions, more regulations. Well, uh, look at Europe. Europe uh, has, lots of Europe has all the gun control laws plus more that anybody here in the United States is proposing. But yet the per capita rate of multiple victim public shootings in Europe is fairly similar to what we have here in the United States. You know, look at Germany, for example. Uh, the two worst K through 12 public school shootings have occurred in Germany, both of them in the last 10 years. Uh, they've had three of the four worst public school shootings, all, all the three in the last 10 years. And yet to go and get a gun, you have to undergo psychological screening tests, you know, and you have to, it takes about a year many different types of hoops that you have to go through. You know, the problem is, again, we all want to try to get guns away from criminals, but 
uh, it's pretty hard. And for somebody who's planning on engaging in a crime years in advance or months, I mean, the Tucson case, the guy apparently had a grudge against the congresswoman since 2007. He bought the gun months ago. And uh, uh, when somebody's willing to plan that much in advance, it's very difficult to stop them from engaging in an attack. Um, as, uh, you know, I think places like Germany and other places have indicated. So, um, uh, you know, and you have to take into account that when we do have these strict rules, and it's the law-abiding people who do that, you're going to end up producing lots of situations where law-abiding citizens aren't going to be able to defend themselves. And, and you're gonna, that loss of defensive gun uses mean increased crimes, just like we see when we ban guns. So I mean, what do you think is going to be the future of this debate? What do you think is going to be next in court, or what do you think is going to be next in Congress in this uh, issue of firearms? And well, there are lots of things that are happening right now. President Obama has banned the importation of some semi-automatic rifles. Uh, it looks like they're putting together rules that would ban a lot of different types of shotguns that have been, even under the Clinton administration, been able to be imported into the United States. Uh, he's appointing a lot of people, judges, around the country who are very anti-self-defense rights. Uh, the two people he's put on the Supreme Court, Sotomayor and uh, Kagan, uh, have written before that they don't believe that there's an individual right to self-defense. So, you know, the two big cases, the Heller and the McDonald cases, where the Supreme Court said that there was an individual right and you couldn't completely ban guns, was five to four decisions. And, uh, you know, so one more change on the court uh, could eliminate those wins that you've had in the past. And, um, you know, and I think of President Obama, who I knew at the University of Chicago, we both taught at the University of Chicago Law School at the same time. Um, you know, he, he doesn't, he told me personally that he doesn't believe people should be able to own guns. And, um, you know, I think that's, you see that in the types of people he's appointed to the Supreme Court. And I think that with regard to gun ownership, it's going to be his lasting legacy. That's amazing. I would have loved to be uh, there for that conversation between you and what ended up being President Obama, right? Right. Well, you know, it's kind of weird at the time. You talk to people that you had no idea. You know, it's just talking to somebody and right. then they turn out to be president. <laughs> well, we know about that in Hawaii, being that he was, uh, we don't know if he was born here, but he's, he's he <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> thank you for joining us today. Oh, thank people you. can read more about uh, your anyway, book. More, More Guns, guns less, less Crime, crime. and your own website, John Lott. Right. And the third edition just came out last year. It's about 200 pages more of new material than was in the second edition. And Great. So. Okay, well, we'll look for you on the Internet and in the, in the bookstores. Thank you so much. Thank you. John Lott, and this has uh, been News Behind the News. I'm Malia Zimmerman. Thank you for joining us.